I'm not sure if its two-year hiatus hurt the momentum of the show, or if nagging the audience in that way is what made it blow up like it did, but by the time season 3 premiered, I think it was safe to call Succession the most popular currently running TV show. If not by audience metrics, then by sheer zeitgeist alone. Maybe Stranger Things has wider spread, but that show is more or less culturally dead in the water, and if anyone over 50 watched Euphoria, they'd have a heart attack. What's great about Succession is worn on its sleeve, the very premise pitched in the show's development before Kendall Roy or Cousin Greg were even names to learn. It's a Shakespearean drama in the corporate broadcast world, a Greek tragedy that doesn't beat for beat modernize a play, but uses the same dramatic essence with modern tools to illustrate gods and titans, fide-eye high-rises above a perpetually overcast New York serving as an Olympus through which American mythology is constructed, except it's all real, with often surprisingly direct analogical characters to real-world figures. And past the pitch phase, this alarming in-touchness is what sets the show apart from other modern attempts at satire. It's not just in-touchness, though. It's a disdain for anything current. Zoomer lingo is thrown around with vitriolic irony that in many ways serves to flesh out our relationship with these titans. Our means of perceiving these people are basically press clips and social media, where they so often present themselves as comically out of touch, which gives us every man a leg up on them. We may not be rich and powerful, but at least we can use Twitter like normal people. What the show posits, more so in this season than anywhere else, is that they aren't out of touch. They know generally what's in, it's just beneath them. They speak the language, but it's not worth their time. The language of business is more lucrative, so they outsource these lesser things to lesser people who don't speak the language of business. Or if they do, just one specialized facet of it. And season three's biggest strength, the chapter that's been increasingly pined after online for years, is that it finally turns its misanthropy and points it at its online audience. E-girls with fucking guns and jewel pods. Thinking about the pacing of the whole show, I think most would agree that it starts off strong enough. It's pretty captivating for the bulk of season one, but episode six serves as a macro inciting incident that elevates the show to a new level that just does not relent. The season ends with a devastating full circle conclusion, followed by a remarkably efficient job at the start of season two, simultaneously catching us up to speed and setting up what's to come, and by episode 3 we're subjected to 8 straight hours of this show at its most coked up, repressedly perverse, and situationally audacious. The number of insane premises for a corporate drama that happen in immediate succession is so severe that watching season 2, as much as I was enjoying it, I had an anxiety about how the show could ever maintain or reach highs like this again. It's burning through so much good material so quickly, I almost want it to slow down like we're eating dessert for dinner. But really, it's dessert with all the nutritional value of a well-balanced meal. The finale gives us the cathartic moment of triumph we've been waiting for the whole show, and again, I was wondering where to go from here. In many ways, it felt like the show could have ended there. That while there was still a lot of plot left to explore, the emotional arc of the series had been completed. But then I remembered that the end of season one felt like a self-contained conclusion that, for the same reasons, could have served as a miniseries. Season two just expanded on it in a way that made its own finale feel like an even more fitting conclusion, and I began to realize that so many of the things I was enjoying about the show were just tenets of good television. Things that have been severely lacking from prestige TV for a while now, that succession accomplishes in spades over and over. Actually, one of the things that caught me off guard about the show is how episodic it is. This type of corporate drama is the exact kind of show prone to a sort of episode-to-episode -episode homogeneity, deals going down in the same few rooms, gradually progressing the overarching story without much in the way of my micro stories to segment each chapter. It's not news that this has been the trend of quote-unquote prestige TV, which is really a symptom of streaming. The episode as a concept doesn't properly exist on those platforms anymore, so the smallest unit to write for is the seasonal arc. Episode breaks are now just moments you can acceptably go to the bathroom for, except not really with autoplay features. but. I'm losing the point here. HBO is generally pretty good about this, because even though most of us are watching these shows on HBO Max rather than the network itself at this point, it still is a network first and a streamer second, forcing them to think in terms of the episode first and foremost. So while you do have your seasonal and full series arcs progressed in each episode, they typically have a pretty self-contained premise. Another thing I think reached a high in season two. Surprisingly little time is spent in the office, most episodes revolving around some sort of trip that provides the show with ver variety of locale and distinct episode aesthetics, but in a way that, more importantly, expresses the show's themes of excess even more bombastically than masturbating in a corner office, for instance. As strong of an image as that is. Expectedly, after so much cataclysm from season 2, and also just the pandemic, season 3 had to start on a much lighter foot. 
taking its time to set up the new normal of the show, considering the shift in dynamic is so much more drastic than from season 1 to 2. In the same way both prior seasons were paced with much more subdued episodes on the front end, so too is season 3, the only differences being that there are naturally more setup episodes this season than in season 2, probably more similar to the pacing of season 1, and that this pacing was then compounded by COVID compliance regulations. So we get a lot more, just a few people hanging out in a private room scenes. Dad, you're on. Hey Sandy. That's pretty much the entire first half of the season, with a couple exceptions, and there are a few ways to interpret this shift in vibe, if you will. You could say it reflects Kendall's disillusion with the excess of Royko. You could say that it preemptively reflects his later disillusion with his own mission, shaving off the excess like he... Uh, shaves his hair. Which would be ironic considering at that point in the season the show has gotten back to its standard excess. Frankly, I think it's just a symptom of shooting during COVID and something we'll have to accept because the people at Royco also have the same stripped down quality to their scenes and Kendall clearly isn't beyond excess even in his mission to make the company ethical. That's of course an intentional contradiction to showcase his hypocrisy and the tragic flaw in his plan and his very line of thinking from the start, but I don't think it fully accounts for how off those first few episodes feel. But again, the show does eventually get back into the excessive swing of things and begins to feel like itself again, particularly in Too Much Birthday, which is admittedly the third to last episode, but this is where things of real consequence start to happen, and the hordes of people feel organic rather than closed off set pieces like in some previous episodes, which almost feel like quotas to convince us they aren't COVID shooting. The finale is also one of the strongest episodes in the whole show, and if some slower episodes at the start setting up the pins where the cost of moments this dramatic and cathartic knocking them down, I would say it was well worth it. And what further saves these episodes from being a complete black spot on the show's record is that they're able to preserve what makes the show cadentially and emotionally engaging. The firewood of the series, so to speak, is situations where characters are unable to say that they love each other. This comes in the form of saying other, generally hurtful things that mean I love you, weaponizing earnestness as a strategic business move or general put-down, or naturally being untrusting of genuine and compassion. And this is something that seemingly comes as naturally from Jesse Armstrong as the timbre of his own voice, something that rings through regardless of unpredictable shooting situations and necessitated narrative reconfigurations. Look at the episode Lion in the Meadow, for instance. It could be seen as total filler, stakes that were invented at the start of the episode that don't affect the trajectory of the rest of the season other than further drilling how not in their favor things are looking with the shareholders. On top of that, the bulk of the episode is basically three characters in a secluded space, the pinnacle of COVID filmmaking. The show, for one, still manages to find excess in this seclusion without hordes of people, in a way that actually calls to mind the season 2 finale. To its credit, that episode earns tension by direct contrast to how not secluded everything else is in the season, but that would have been a good setting for a season 3 episode. Anyway, what's more important here is that what saves the episode from being throwaway filler is that it's still able to scratch the itch and twist the knife in Kendall and Logan's relationship. Logan waxing earnest about Kendall being a good kid is calculated enough in how he qualifies it business-wise that we genuinely believe he may really love Kendall, but the nature of the situation and their past still keep us suspicious, which on its own is a powerful moment, and then in classic succession fashion, we're subjected to immediate whiplash as they swing back and forth at each other with petty but fundamentally scathing assessments of each other, which we also don't necessarily believe either because it's all business, but it's here we see that they really do love each other on some level level, even if business takes priority. This also happens when Kendall tries to rally his siblings and then immediately disparages them. This is the musicality of the show. To a greater point, look at the shareholder meeting. It's been teased the whole show as the cataclysmic event their entire well-beings hinge upon, and what ends up happening there isn't even that important in the grand scheme of things. What we get instead is a surprisingly self-contained commentary on the anxieties of functioning as a person without parental guidance, which further emphasizes the strength of Succession's episodic approach and attests to its staying power. You can only go through so many hoops to stretch out a directly linear plot without jumping the shark, but to be able to craft these compelling micro-stories is how you maintain the ability to justify giving the audience more of the characters they love. And I think the reason that the micro-stories presented in Lion in the Meadow and the retired janitors of Idaho are enough to warrant their own episodes is that they tap into what's essential about the show's setting. Yes, it's a satire of the ruling class, but it's not the show's singular goal to point out what's bad about people we already know are bad. That's almost a byproduct of this being a business show. The foundation of any good show, or probably any good story, is circumstance and pathos. 
That goes without saying. It's not about selling meth, it's about family. It's not about a school club, it's about outcasts. We're not in the coffee business serving people, we're in the people business serving coffee. That's 101. But even with something like The Sopranos that draws a familial connection between the circumstance of the mob and immediate domestic family life and, you know, depression and everything else, the mob is almost incidental. That's the circumstance of the show, but it doesn't directly dictate the overtones of what the show is saying about life. With Succession, the circumstance has a more direct causality to the pathos than any show I've seen in a while. Business isn't incidental, it's essential. Everyday audiences don't just tolerate the business jargon for the personal drama, they watch it specifically for how the business jargon directly inflicts the personal drama. It's the sole reason, the sole excuse, for people to say these horrible things to each other. And they have plausible deniability because, again, it's just business. But then business practices bleed into the personal. Okay, well, what happens in Sex Vegas? Right. And therein lies the fundamental curse, the inability to trust what anyone is saying, the constant state of feeling gaslit that's only exacerbated by anyone saying anything to them, and the only protection left to burrow into when you can't trust the emotions of anyone around you is irony. This is in many ways the show's target. Greed and irony are sort of the two vices posited here. Greed is the umbrella that in many ways causes irony through boredom of excess and through the emotional manipulation required to do business, but irony is the thing that leaves everyone on their toes and untrusting. It's worth noting that Ken Kendall's drug use, after years of sobriety, is never presented as a vice in and of itself. We can presume that his drug use before rehab was an extension of excess that cost him his family, things that still creep through every now and then, but as we see him in the show's present, the drug use is the consequence of his current untrustingness and alienation. A visual indicator of these mental states, and a coping mechanism more so than an addiction in and of itself. But this is a self-fueling cycle, because irony is also a coping mechanism, emotional armor that sort of a sticks and stones mantra, because at the end of the day, irony at its most successful asserts that you don't care about anything, so how could anything hurt you? Just a tooth. I'll get another one. This is why the tragedy of the Roys is that pretty much the only way they can ever show that they love each other is by successfully hurting each other and being hurt. That's not something unique to the 1% of the 1%. People have gone after this season for being exponentially more online than previous seasons, throwing red pills and engagements left and right, wrongly accusing it of vapidly trying to capitalize on Twitter screen grabs, and while a lot of the plot itself more overtly revolves around Twitter this season, these elements are in service of that repression and alienation that are central to quote-unquote irony poisoning, which the pathos of the whole show is hinged on, and its hard pivot to online-ness only serves to emphasize the universality of these things. So jump on the irono cycle and uh, make it into a thing. In many ways, I see succession as a direct response to phenomena like the new sincerity movement, combating postmodern irony not by delivering the exact opposite in a wholesome 100 package, but by confronting it head on, on its own terms. Rather than burying its head in the sand and proposing a world where people are nice to each other, the show uses the ironic framework of satire to show irony in action, which ironically makes its moments of actual earnestness more sincere than new sincerity. In the same way that the irony poisoned Roy's can only show affection by successfully hurting each other, the show understands that the only way to connect with its irony poisoned audience is by taking caustic measures to step on our throats, spit in our mouths, etc, etc. Only by self-consciously tapping into stuff real people currently talk about, lingo real people currently use, only by making knowingly provocative decisions like casting Dasha Nekrasova as a social media specialist, is it able to adopt the proper ethos to establish that it's speaking the language, and show that it cares about such a combative audience by successfully hurting them with these jabs. This successfully scathing in-touchness is is rare in film in general, and especially outside of the indie circle, whose filmmakers are generally down to earth without the industry ballooning them. A series as high profile as Succession hitting these marks is as impressive as business executives themselves hitting the marks in the show, probably because that's essentially what's really happening. Executives operating a TV behemoth, ironically throwing lingo around into a product that consists of executives operating a TV behemoth, ironically throwing lingo around, that sounds about as postmodern as it gets. So it's an additional feat that the show in no way presents itself as a meta work. It has these unignorable meta qualities, but it still preserves a sense of dramatic distance from the audience, so the show is able to have it both ways. But the cracks of earnestness are slowly opening up, 
giving the show a sense of direction in the long run. I'll watch Succession for as long as Armstrong and the writers are able to preserve the musicality of these characters berating each other, but at a certain point, it becomes monotonous without a forward momentum, as just a cyclical collection of irony this and fuck you that. Those moments of earnestness are powerful because they're so scarce, again, effectively negging the audience except for those few moments of levity. They're so few and far between, in fact, that you almost start to doubt that they even happened. I don't want to over-generously throw around the term gaslighting, but considering how the characters treat each other, and how those other qualities play into the show's meta self-evaluation, there's a case to be made that the show is formally gaslighting the audience. But again, I think the season 3 finale is a big step toward these cracks opening up. The characters are able to tell each other that they love each other straight up without hurting each other, and the show presents genuinely empathetic moments of catharsis without any tricks up its sleeve. We see Kendall, Roman, and Tom all abandon their dutiful post Hosts, so to speak. Kendall admits to the waiter situation, Roman disobeys Logan and admits his admiration for his siblings, and Tom betrays Shiv, which are all acts against another person, but more importantly, acts of rebellion against their own self-destructive natures. And it's not like we haven't gotten moments like this before, but they're slowly taking a stronger precedence in the show, following a similar trajectory to the Jerry-Roman relationship, actually, which is only explicitly touched on in three or four scenes in season two, but informs the subtext of the other scenes with them in a Kuleshavian way, and has become much more front and center and directly examined in season 3. The emotional core, from the start of the show, treats the character and audience pathos as as repressed as Roman's psychosexual situation. I mean, basically everyone's repressed in the show, but I think this unraveling of irony most closely follows the pacing of Roman's unraveling. Kendall and Shiv fluctuate back and forth in their ailments, and Tom excels past the level of self-actualization the show is at in the finale's last moments. But I think Roman is at just the right level of confronting his spiritual blockages and opening up that the show would like us to be at with plenty of room to go, but having some sort of end goal in sight. For this reason, despite being a show about real-world villains and cultural decay, the decline of a corporate Goliath but only at the hands of newer corporate Goliaths growing, which is to say the decline of the modern world, there's a genuine optimism to succession that's missing from other satires and new sincerity entries alike, flipping the expectation that this is a tragedy in the first place. Only by digging into the weeds like it does is it able to convince the terminally online, most of whom are likely going through a lot less than the characters in the show, that there is a path to self-fulfillment. It does so using the worst people in the world, but how could it possibly tap into such spiritual gunk by being about good people. Peeling back the curtain, that's about all I've got in terms of intelligent write-up material, but I did want to say a few more things about the season just to dump all my thoughts out candidly, or as candidly as I can be while still reading a script. But without getting too postmodern here, I'm just gonna say Tom is still my favorite character. He has the strongest comic and empathetic moments throughout the season, finale aside. Now, as noted by the naysayers who accuse the show of merely shooting for Twitter screen grabs, it's important to think about the characters not just in terms of moments, but in terms of linear arc and thematic throughline, but the currency of these things is moments. Even though Greg doesn't have the most compelling arc, he has enough moments to make him a fan favorite. In the past, I would have argued that that's the case with Roman too, but he's become one of the most dynamic characters, and it's because of sheer capital M moments. It's honestly a testament to the show's stamina that they're still able to give so many characters organic progressions without it feeling like character busy work. Like I didn't expect much else from Tom after this scene with Shiv, but he's still number one. I didn't know what else they could do with Kendall either after his revelation, but he's still one of the most unique and compelling protagonists on TV. I wasn't entirely sold on the Comfrey Greg buildup, which got kind of dropped anyway, but it was in service of Greg's descent which itself I think was punctuated well. I feel like this season there are also a lot more scenes directly confronting character qualities, particularly with Greg, things we've only previously seen in action unaddressed explicitly. I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, speaking into existence things we were only meant to feel before, but I think it's at least somewhat necessary for that sense of trajectory I was talking about, these characters reckoning with themselves rather than just wallowing in their ways. I don't know, for so much of this season things just felt off while watching in the present, but in retrospect, everything aside from the COVID stuff was so meticulous and inductive. I'll have to see how knowing how the pieces pay off lends itself to repeat viewings of the season, but it really felt like watching your home team take the lead with mere seconds left on the clock. It's the first finale that 
feels like it's actively ushering us into the next chapter rather than closing itself off there, but I think that's what the show needs at this point to maintain its momentum, which is why it's such a brilliant finale. But hey, let me know what you thought. I think it's safe to call this the most polarizing season so far. Is the golden era of succession over? Does season 3's commitment to modernity refute the notion of there being a golden era in the first place? Discuss below, links to my social media and Patreon are in the description. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.